Hey everyone, welcome to lesson six. I'm so excited about this lesson. Well, there's many reasons why, but first and foremost is that I don't have Scott Lindsay. I actually have a fan of the Denver Broncos here, but to all you Patriot fans, it's okay. But anyway, the reason I really love having Addison Bevere here is because Addison is a student of the Word of God, and he has the utmost respect for the Word of God. Matter of fact, one of the wisest young men I know, I don't know too many men that have written an entire commentary on the New Testament verse by verse by the time they were 25 years old, yet Addison did it. I didn't even know he was doing it until he was in the middle of it. So Addison... It's just for me, though. I would never want anyone to actually read it. I bet a lot of people would benefit. You, you think, but... But, but actually, no, you get a lot of wisdom by writing things yeah, down. You're you do. very wise to do that. So the reason, uh, another reason I'm excited about this lesson is we're going to talk about how to approach the Bible. Yeah. When I sit down in the morning and I open up this book. Where do you go? How do I approach yeah. it? Where do you go? Yeah. What's your attitude? What's your posture? This is so important. So uh, we have a foundational scripture for this lesson, and it's Ezra 7.10. I love this. For Ezra had prepared his heart. Now, just stop there. Prepared his heart. This is what we're going to teach you in this lesson, yeah. how to prepare your heart. He prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord, to seek the word of God, to do it, and to teach statutes and ordinances in Israel. I love it. There's three things he had to prepare his heart to do. Number one, to read it. Number two, to do it. Number three, to teach it. And all of you are called to be teachers. Yeah. The writer of Hebrews says, by this time, you ought to be teachers. Every one of us are called as ambassadors yeah. of the kingdom of God and ambassadors are teachers. You really learn something when you, when you have to teach it too. Yeah, you do. <laughs> you realize what you don't know. Yeah, yeah. that's so very, good. very good. It's good to have to do that. Um, so number one, we're going to go through several. Yeah. Number one, approach, and this to me, I had to put this first because this is the one that impacted me the most when I was a very, very young man, got saved in my fraternity in college. Approach the Bible prayerfully with the Holy Spirit. There is a scripture that I saw as a baby Christian. I was only saved six months. And I will never, ever forget this scripture jumped up off the page. It's Psalm 119, 18. Open my eyes to see wonderful truths from your instructions, from your word. This is a closed book. It's a closed book. You can't understand this book without the help of the Holy Spirit. So still to this day, 40 years later, Every single morning when I sit down and I open up my Bible, I say, Holy Spirit, please show me facets, ways of Jesus that I've never seen before. Yeah. Because the Holy Spirit comes to reveal Jesus to us. That's his favorite thing to do. If you want to know what the Holy Spirit's favorite yeah. thing to do yeah. is, he loves to talk about Jesus. Yeah. So if you really want to get on the good side of the Holy Spirit, just start talking about Jesus. Just say, show me about Jesus, okay? Um, it's very, very important, and you, you say, you, you literally talk to the Holy Spirit. Well, yeah, isn't he a teacher? Jesus said, I'm not leaving his orphans. I'm sending a helper, a teacher. One of the words, it's parakletos, which means he's a teacher. Yeah. It's I've better never... for you that I go away. Right. He's a... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Come on. Let's yeah. talk about better that, Better for you that I go away. Yeah, because the teacher, the Holy Spirit, the comforter, the helper, he's going to come and reveal the depths of truth. Okay, so why is that better than having Jesus? Well, because the Holy Spirit is available to all of us. Jesus was confined to a single body person, yeah. at a, at a person, single location. Time, right? Absolutely, yeah. But the spirit had of Jesus he had to sleep. Yes, but the spirit of Jesus Christ illuminates the deep things of Scripture. And that's Paul's big point, 1 Corinthians 2. That. He's like, the spirit understands the deep things of God, the deep things of existence, those answers that we seek day in and day out as we're going through life. It's the Holy Spirit who reveals those to us So is that scripture. why 40 years later I love the Bible probably Absolutely. more than when I first got There's saved? There's so many dimensions to the Word of yeah. God. Yeah, yeah. So we're talking about the Word of God as God personified, right? Like Jesus became the Word, the Word became flesh. This is the continuation of that ministry revealed through the Spirit. So we're talking about something that blows our understanding out of the waters. It just does. And yeah. so it takes a lifetime to really grapple with what this book represents and what it means for our lives. So good. You know, uh, Paul said in Corinthians, but the people's minds were hardened. And to this day... When the Old Covenant, which is part of Scripture, sure. is being read, the same veil covers their minds so they cannot understand the truth. But now listen to what Paul says. But whenever someone turns to the Lord, the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now, who is the Lord he's talking about here? It's not Jesus. Uh-uh. He said, Spirit for the Lord is the Spirit, yeah. the Spirit of Jesus yeah. Christ. And wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, that's where you're going to find freedom. And a better translation of that is wherever the Spirit is Lord, that's where there is freedom. He's yes. not allowed to be Lord everywhere. Right. So where Jesus went, we saw an expression of freedom. Yes. 
Yes. But it was confined to his, his location. Yeah. But now when we submit ourselves to the Lordship of Jesus and we live in tune with his spirit, we bring that expression of freedom. So we allow lives. the spirit to be Lord. See, Absolutely. Let, let's say it this way. I know churches that don't allow him to be sure. Lord. They tell him what to do. Well, they want to manipulate scripture. Yeah. They want to be Lord. Yeah. So they, they're control freaks. Human beings are control freaks by nature. So we use scripture as a way to control everything. Which is not freedom. It's not yielding you to know, the Addison, spirit. You know, I'll never forget the time I was in worship in Canada. I was getting ready to speak at a church or a conference. I can't remember. It doesn't matter. And right in the middle of worship, the Holy Spirit asked me, he said, do you know what a religious spirit is? And I thought, I've written on it. I've heard people teach on it. I've read men's books about it. Obviously, I don't know what it is because the Holy Spirit's not asking He's me not a question to get information. Yeah. Right. So I said, wisely said, I said, no, I don't, I guess yeah. I don't know what, a, he yeah. said a religious spirit is one who uses my word to mm. execute his own will. Yeah. And I went, whoa. We saw that in the Pharisees. Right. And if we're honest, we see that in our own lives. Yeah. And that's why we have to be the humble. The more mature we become, the more the word of God is Lord to us. Absolutely. Oh, and we I realize those moments when we're using the word of God for our own aims. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. So number you know, two, we got to keep moving. Uh, we do. Otherwise, we're never going to get through these eight. Uh, we, when, we, when we read the scripture, we have to approach it yeah. as the word of God. Which is what you guys have been getting at this whole course. Right. It right. is God's word. Yes. And uh, I want to read the scripture because I love the scripture. Okay, listen. 1 Thessalonians 2.13, Paul says, For this reason, we also thank God without ceasing. Because when you receive the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the word of men, yeah. but as in truth, the word of God. Now listen, this is the part I love, which also effectively works in you who believe. Wow. So it effectively, literally changes us into the image of Christ if we believe. Right. There's so much in this. Right. I mean, why do you think people who read the word four, to, four more times per week saw a change in their lives? That's so true. Right there. Why do, have I gotten on airplanes? I told you, just on one airline last year, I flew 227,000 miles. Just on one airline. For those of you that don't know, that is uh, nine times around. somehow he has a around, great marriage. That is nine times around the earth. That's Why do I do that? Because I believe the word of God will effectively work in the Amen. people that I'm preaching Amen. to. Amen. I believe that. Otherwise, I'm not flying that much. Yeah, okay? that's good. So let's go to the next one. The third, all right, I got this one. Approach it with it. humility. And, Ooh, and I, I, love I love this because humility determines capacity. Yep. When you're reading God's word, yep. your level of humility will determine your level of capacity to receive I from God's that. word. So I love, I love the Apostle Paul in the book of Romans. So he's writing this letter and he is, he is uh, his intellectual prowess is on display. Yes, we know that he is inspired by the Holy Spirit. He's writing away. It's beautiful. And he gets to chapter 11 after sharing these beautiful wonders, and he goes, oh, the depths of the riches, of the wisdom, of the knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments. How unsearchable are his ways. They're, they're, they're so far above anything that I can comprehend. And so there's something about humility that opens up God's word to us. And if we refuse to approach his word in humility, which really is about submission, we are going to uh, preclude this opportunity to receive the fullness of the gift of salvation. And that's what James hits on in James 1.21. James 1.21, receive with meekness the implanted word, logos, which has the power to save your souls. That's so good. That implanted word, it has the power to change every aspect of your existence wow. if you receive it with humility. Okay, so let's talk about humility. you got four children, okay? Yeah. Um, grandchildren. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what are some of the characteristics of a child? That's actually, that's actually the next one. The Is next it? point, yeah. Oh. Approach it with a childlike attitude. Okay, I yeah. jumped into the next point. No, 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 it's okay. I wasn't even no, intended. No, that's good. No, it's, it's perfect. There's so, a flow here. There is, there's a flow. So <laughs> Matthew 18, verse 3. Okay. So who, who gets to enter the kingdom of God or the I, kingdom of heaven? If, unless you become like a child, like a you child. will not in, in, in enter the kingdom of God. Absolutely. Jesus said. Okay. So, so when we become childlike, meaning we have this sense of awe and curiosity and wonder in how we approach truth and how we approach our world, and how we approach ourselves and what God has spoken over us. We get to enter into God's sovereign realm. Yeah. So his way of seeing things, his way of moving things forward, his will, we align ourselves with that. So when we're childlike, we start to see things differently. I know uh, my son, he's, he's nine, and he loves asking me really hard questions because he's very curious. And, and we, so we go through scripture at night, which by the way, parents, here's a little tip. If you have small children, use nighttime bed routine to get 
those little nuggets into their hearts That's really because good. they don't want to go to bed and you can leverage that and be like, hey, let's talk about something deep. And children, they come alive at that time. Anyway, so he was asking me this question because he knows this is how you I get that extra from mother. wake time. And we're, we're sitting there and I'm putting him to bed. And he goes, Dad, I, I, want, you, I want you to take me somewhere. I'm like, yeah, where, where do you want me to take you? And he goes, I want you to take me to those places where I can still see God's fingerprints. Your son said that? Yeah. And at, I, Asher. Asher. At nine years yeah, old. Yeah, nine years old. And I'm like, finger. And I, I just look at him and go, what do you mean? He said, I want to see the places on the earth where God's fingers made an impression when he spun the world into motion. And I just sat there and I looked at him and I was like, wow. And then for a moment, that part of me that wants wow. to give an answer was about to give him truncated theology and theory and science. And the fear of God came on me. And I was like, don't you, don't, God was like, don't you say a word. Don't you say a word. Just sit in this moment. And I just looked at him and I said, I want to go there. I want to see those spots. And then I started thinking about it. We do business in the bluffs created by his fingertips. We live in the shadows of his handiwork. The, we should have this childlikeness, this sense of awe in the world that we live in. And that should carry over in how we approach the word of God, the eternal word of God. You know, Addison, I've um, been reading the Bible for 40 years and um, I still am in awe and I, I look at a child, and a child asks curious questions, yeah. doesn't overthink things, doesn't ever think, hey, I know more. Um, you know, we're students as children, right? Yeah. And, and that's the way, I mean, still 40 years later, guys, and I still feel like I'm opening up the most awe-inspiring book in the world, and it's because I am. And so I've never lost that, and I never want to lose that. When I'm 80 yeah. years old, I want to open up my Bible the same way. I remember one time I heard a very disconcerting comment made by a very well-known minister. This was one of the best-known ministers in the whole globe. And he, he said, you know, I've been reading this Bible for, I think he said, like 40 years. And he said, you know, sometimes it can just, you know, here we go again. Yeah. And when he said that, I was like, oh, really? And then people looked at me when I first got saved, and they'll, they'll say, you're going to lose your zeal for the Bible. And, you know, I said, that will never happen. I said that to myself. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to be a smart aleck. And I said, you know, that will never happen. And you know what? I'm 60 and it hadn't happened. I still am passionate. I still am excited. My kids still see me reading the Bible Absolutely. when they come down early in the morning yeah. because I just think it's the greatest book on the planet. It is. You know? It is. And so, um, you know, Addison, what, what's, our, what's our next point next one here? Is, yeah, a, approach it reverently. I wanted to hey, take no, this, that this one. This is yours. You, this get, you get this. You get but, this. But Mr. I want you to help me because you, you, you. you and I really. I will help you. So, to approach the Bible reverently yeah. is the fear of the Lord. Yeah. And I love this. Proverbs 1, 7 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. What kind of knowledge? Is, the, is it the beginning of knowledge of science, knowledge of mathematics, knowledge of, let's say, you know, scripture? No, Proverbs chapter 2 tells us. Proverbs chapter 2 says, my son, if you receive... Now listen to, these, listen to this. Hmm. My son, if you receive my words... And treasure, listen to the word, treasure my commands within you so that you incline, that means you're listening, right? Incline, you, you incline your ear to wisdom. You apply, apply your heart to understanding. Yes, if you cry out for discernment and lift up your voice for understanding, if you seek her as silver and search for her as hidden treasures, are you hearing this? Then you will understand the fear of yeah. the Lord and you will find the knowledge of God. So it's the fear of the Lord is the beginning of what kind of knowledge? The knowledge intimate. of intimate, intimate knowledge, knowledge of, God. of God, knowing God intimately. Yeah. That's where it begins. And you, we know yeah. this because Psalm 25, God says, the Lord is a friend. Listen to these words. The Lord is a friend. I want to be the friend of God. Intimate friend. He's the intimate friend to those who fear him. He teaches them his covenant. Yeah. Man. I mean, come on, the angels are still crying out, holy, holy, right. holy, and shaking a building that seats probably over right. a billion beings in it in heaven. Yeah, so Isaiah's account, Isaiah 6, he encounters God, yeah. and, and he's taken back by God's holiness. Yeah. And he says, woe is me, I must be silent. Some translations say, I'm a man of unclean lips. What he really says in the Hebrew is, I must be silent. Wow. Because what he's saying is, I cannot put words to the otherness, to the beauty, to the majesty that is before me. But, but listen, then, he, what, says, he says, woe is me. He says, woe is me. He just said in chapter 5, woe, woe to the to drunkard, woe else. to the pride, woe to all, all the bad then people. Then he sees God and goes, woe is woe me. Woe is me, because he's encountering yeah. the beauty, the otherness, yeah. the majesty of this God that he had known about, 
through, through other people's accounts, but he is seeing. And he's like, this is something entirely other. But then what's so neat is God, through an angel, takes a coal and puts it on his lips. And the man who says, woe is me, I must be silent, a few moments later is saying, here I am, Lord, as send a messenger, me. send me. That's and so God, as we encounter God's word, you the, that initial, you do, you become a messenger. Yeah. Your life becomes a message because you encounter a message that is other than what this world sees in scripture. And then as you engage with God through scripture, your life becomes that message. I love that. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. That's okay. The fear of the Lord. So we're going to talk about uh, approach it consistently. This one's me. Yeah, it is. So, you? yeah. So this, this is, this is an interesting one. I think there's a lot of condemnation around this one. And I want to use the example of a relationship. So I've been married for 11 years. And if I look back over the course of my marriage, I see different seasons. Mm -hmm. uh, but in every season, I've been a husband, and I've been a father. I've showed up as a husband and I've showed up as a father. Now that looks different each season, just because the needs, um, the requirements, the challenges, all those things shift from season to season, opportunities, they shift, right. but I show up. That's how it is with the Word of God. We need to show up day in and day out. Now, seasons change. So it might look wow. different from one season to the next because remember, this is ultimately about a relationship. Yeah. This isn't just a practice for the sake of practice. And that's the thing with discipline. We're talking about consistency. I'm talking about a relationship here. When I look at my relationship with my wife, me showing up day in and day out isn't a discipline that I do for the sake of discipline. It's a discipline that I do for the sake of relationship right because I have made a covenant commitment to my wife to my children to show up to be there to figure out what's required of me in that relationship in that season and so people have to be in tune to the Holy Spirit and be aware of the season that they're in but they have to show up you have to show up to be aware of your this. season I you have to this. show up and and a lot of people they get they get discipline twisted they get it confused when they lose sight of the why behind the discipline so I would say to people That's out there, good. if you're struggling with the discipline of being in the word, you have to go back to the why. Why is this important? Why should this. this be a part of your life? Because from that sense of why, from that awareness of why, we find the tenacity, we find the desire and the dedication to show up and do it consistently. Because when you show up consistently, we saw it again in the stats, four or more times a week, what happens to your life across the board, across the spectrum, everything changes. Yeah. Everything changes. We just show up four times a week at least. At least four times a week. I mean, I think that's a great goal for everyone out there. Now, be aware of your season now. Be aware of your season. What does consistency look like in your season? And then show up. You know, um, try with all your heart to do seven, but make sure you do at least four, especially by seeing those stats. In the sense of, and, and remember, you're not, you're not showing up to read four chapters. Okay, and I, I really... Hey, now, let me ask you this. Do you have seasons where you do read four chapters every day and then seasons where you read six chapters or seasons when you read four verses and you just soak, yeah. meditate on those four yes. verses, right? Yes. Just depending just on the recently, season. Just recently, I remember I, 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 I literally was seated in my office early in the morning for 30, 35 minutes, and I'd only gotten through half the chap yeah. chapter, and it was a shorter chapter in the epistles. And it was just because the Holy Spirit was ministering to me so much. And it's so important that we understand we are meeting with a being, the most powerful, amazing, loving, wise being in the universe. Yeah. And that's the way you approach this Bible. Um, approach it expectantly. Approach it expectingly. Yeah. All right, so we're just talking yeah. about that. Everything's leading yeah, into each is. other. That's... You know, this is a posture of faith. Yes. Um, I want to read a scripture to you that's mind-blowing. This, this, is, this is probably one of the most mind-blowing scriptures in the New Testament, in my opinion. Hebrews 4, 2, for indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them. Yeah. Not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. Wow. Okay, that's amazing. They heard the word and they heard it a lot. So they showed up, yeah. but they didn't mix it with faith. They didn't expect to hear from God. I'll never forget the time when God spoke to me and he said, son, when you come to me and you approach me, you hope that I show yeah. up. And I said, I do. He said, son, I said, draw near to me and I will draw near to you. He said, I didn't say I might draw near to you. I said, I would draw near to you. And I went, whoa. And you know that every time I've gone in the prayer closet since, the presence of God has been there, boom, because I went in faith. Yeah. So 
it's so important that you go in expecting. If you just think, oh, I'm gonna read my four chapters today, you're not gonna get nothing. You sure. might as well just go to work, honey. But <laughs> here's the deal. We have to mix it with faith. Yeah. For we have heard the good news of deliverance. This is Hebrews 4.2 from the TPT Bible. For we have heard the good news of deliverance just as they did, yet they did not join their faith with the word. Instead, what they heard didn't affect them deeply, for they doubted. That's very powerful right there. Yeah. It's, it's very, very important that when we approach the Bible, that we approach it, that we're going to believe what we read instead of read into it what we already believe. Yeah. I hope you caught what I just said. Believe what you read. Don't read into it what you believe. And the final, approach it desperately. And, and I think of blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they will be filled. When I... When I eat Thanksgiving, going into Thanksgiving, I'm always oh my hungry. I'm always hungry, Our women expected can cook. <laughs> for that Thanksgiving meal. But then afterwards, I'm not hungry. You could put a massive meal in front of me. I'm not going to eat it. Why? Right. Because I'm full. And, and this idea of desperation, it's about not filling yourself up with other things. We need a hunger and thirst for righteousness. And this verse could also be translated, and I really like this, this stylization of this verse. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for the intimate revelation of God and his way. Wow. Intimate revelation of God and his ways. So that is something that we have to approach with desperation. Why? Because God wants us desperate in a like weird needy sense. No, he wants us to have a capacity to take in the fullness that is ours in him. That is so He doesn't good. want us coming to him with a full stomach. He wants us coming in desperate, hungry. You know, I, it, it reminds me of the scripture. It says, the soul that is full will loathe the honeycomb. Yeah. Um, I think that's Proverbs 27, 7. You know, um, when you're already filled with the things of this world, when the honeycomb of God's word comes by, you'll take it for yeah. granted. You, you, you know, you're desperate for food on Thanksgiving because sure. you starve yourself. We play football in the morning and then we yeah, don't eat we until work, about we two. We work up an appetite. We're all just starving. Absolutely. But boy, if she was to serve that same meal just two hours after that massive feast, well, I might, I might be hungry two hours afterwards, but like okay. 30 minutes afterwards. For our 60 year olds, yeah, uh, yeah two hours afterwards, down. I could say that. Hey, listen, we've come to the close and I, I really want to bring a wrap on this. The whole purpose for this course was to create a great hunger in you for the Word of God. What we don't want to see is you to become a person who argues, a person who is a Pharisee that is very much of a stickler and closes people's off, people off. I want to remember our foundational scripture that we started with. It says uh, this. It says, study and be eager. And I'm going to read this out of the Amplified. Study and be eager and do your utmost to present yourself to God approved, a workman who has no cause to be ashamed, correctly analyzing and accurately dividing, rightly handling and skillfully teaching the word of truth. But listen to the next statement, but avoid all empty, vain, useless and idle talk. Yeah. We do not want you to become students of the Bible so that you can have good arguments with people. <laughs> so you can show people that you know more than So you can than show them. people up on Facebook. Yeah, <laughs> remember the servant of the Lord <laughs> must be gentle, must be apt yeah. to teach, must be patient, must be kind. Yeah. You are to realize that God will reveal things to you, not for you to show people what you know more, but for you to be able to help people and bring them into a relationship Absolutely. with Jesus Christ. I want to end this, Addison, in prayer. I want to pray what I always pray when I read the Bible for you, and that is this, Father, in the name of Jesus, my brothers, my sisters, they've walked through this course because they're hungry to hear from you. I pray that you'd open their eyes so that they can behold beautiful truths from your word. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would reveal to them Jesus every time they open the Bible. Reveal Jesus to them like they've never known him before. Lord, we want to walk with you. We want a relationship with you. This is what we ask for. Reveal yourself to us as we read the scripture. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let me say this. We have supplemental lessons to go deeper into different areas. Please, please enjoy Check those. Them out. But you have gone through this six lesson course and I'm telling you, you are now ready to jump into the Bible and let God speak to you for your own life. Addison, thank you for being on. Thank us. you, sir. It's been Always wonderful. We love you. you guys. God bless you.